we must be very clear when we talk about use of these, the use of poverty line and the, uh, the data sources on the basis of which you draw inferences about the incidence of poverty. You must be careful about. Don't stretch the inferences to talk about the quality of life of, of, the, of the groups which you are studying. Because that depends on a whole lot of other circumstances. And they are highly variable across regions and over time. Any standard you adopt for desirable minimum income living is a normative one. Now, it is this, this aspect of the normative character of it is important because what are, what are you saying? He says, if all, as reasonable people, we agree that uh, this is the kind of comp composite level and composition of commodity consumption that is, can be considered reasonable, acceptable socially. Then we, we have a basis on which we can compare change, uh, you know, between states and across states and over time and so on. Now, what is the anchoring of this? The original calorie norms. There was a huge debate about the meaningfulness of the, see, the, about uh, the interpretation of the nutritional norm. Uh, you see, the nutritional norm is, is, is based on the nutritional expert's judgment of what is the requirement of calories, proteins, for healthy, active life of a population or of a household of defined characteristics, age, sex, and so on. Professor Sukhatme, who is who's himself a very well-known nutritionist, although not very much a currency, in currency now. He said, look, the fact that, you know, these, these are useful for sort of uh, normative purposes, but the relationship between food intake and nutritional health status is very much more complicated. To accept a certain norm for certain purposes, for the limited purpose of saying, given that norm, what proportion of people in rural and urban areas and over, over time in different states fall below, which is, which is useful as a reference point in social discourse on the development strategy and its impact. But having done that, when you say, for instance, with the, the nutritional norm-based poverty line and the NSS-based estimates of poverty incidence, it doesn't mean that uh, even if they consume 2,500 calories or whatever it is, that they are, you know, it, it, it doesn't tell you about the health status or the nutritional status of the population. Partly because there are huge variations across states on the quality of food and the quality of public health. So, there are so many other factors which come in. You cannot infer about the welfare status of, uh, in terms of health and well nutrition on the basis of the poverty estimates. I think that uh, this distinction is important and it is seldom adequately understood. This is one country where there have been rural nutrition surveys, sample surveys, in about 12 states for 30 years continuously. The National Nutrition Monitoring Bureau. Now what it shows is that in spite of all the increase in per capita income, everything, everything, the average calorie intake and the quality of food 
intake, which is based on actual measurements, not on uh, interviews and so on, has not changed very much. In fact, a substantial proportion of the population is well below the 2000, whatever the norm is. But there has been a progressive improvement in terms of other indicators of health, for instance, height, weight, mortality, morbidity. So, you know, there is a puzzle here which has not been resolved. No, even, there is a controversy even now. You have the NSS sample service on which the poverty estimates are done. Now, there the real data constraint that's coming is that although our population has increased significantly, our sample size has not. Okay? This is particularly true in urban areas. You know, urban areas have grown much faster than the country as a whole. Right? But our sample sizes remain exactly the same. So over time, the, uh, what should I say, the accuracy, or the reliability, not the accuracy, accuracy is still accurate, the reliability of the NSS estimates for urban areas is becoming weaker. Okay? And that's a resource problem, that NSS simply does not have the wherewithal to be able to increase the sample size sufficiently. Okay? That's number one. Number two, again this is predominantly an urban problem, is that there has been very rapid increase in uh, uh, response resistance. So as I said, it takes about two and a half to three hours to administer the questionnaire. In rural areas, our investigators do get that kind of time. In urban areas, they're more or less kicked out after one hour. Okay? So they have to really, you know, in a sense, fast forward the, the data collection and the quality suffers as a consequence of that. So there's a lot of respondent fatigue happening and people's unwillingness to give time. So in a sense, I think the quality of the data is getting compromised. There is no alternative but to a survey. So now you have to think about taking this as a reality, accepting that people are not going to give you this much time. Can you have a questionnaire that doesn't violate that time constraint? That's not easy to do. Because then you hit, you then you hit other problems, you know. There's then you hit problems, things which are called recall problems. So, for instance, if I say, "How much did you spend on dal?" You will give me one answer, right? Let's say in the last week. If I said, "All right, how much did you spend on buying masoor ka dal, moong ka dal, rajma?" And you are going to give me figures for each of this because you bought them, and then I total it up. I'll get a completely different figure than the figure you would have given me saying that I spent so much on dolls. Okay? And this second figure would be much more accurate. Which is why the NSS question has 600 items listed. Okay? 